<laughs> that's kind of like how it got birthed and how it got born. But um, yeah, it, it started because uh, a lot of my stuff just kept getting censored on the regular page. And I was like, I wish there was a page where, you know, I could post whatever I wanted yeah, and right. wouldn't be deleted. <laughs> and then there you go. All hell broke loose for the first two months of that. Um, that was fun. Yeah, dude, those those first few months on that page were utterly legendary. Like everyone chiming in about all the puke that they didn't get out from their years selling books. And, you know, just totally uh, what the heck? Braxton. Okay, that was weird. Anyway, all the all the uh, you know, just random people chiming in and just totally bagging on, you know, CEOs and former CEOs of Southwestern and talking about the drama they're in. And I don't know, it, it was like, everybody was glued to that group for a while. I was uh, definitely one of those, so. I actually have very, very minimum, if, if any, uh, grievances with Southwestern. I just think it's yeah. funny. You know oh, what I mean? Gosh. Like outside, outside of that, I just think um, a lot of it is, it's just funny to talk about. Um, but as far as like actual, um, actual upsets and actual grievances, they're very, very low. I agree with that. And that's very core to your troll way of being. That's accurate. <laughs> selling out for the, selling out for the LOLs and likes. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, man. So, uh, we'll, we'll hop on to Facebook live here in a couple minutes, but, uh, just cool. to give you the rundown, um, I love when I'm hosting alone, cause it's like total freestyle um, with Andres, he, he's a bit more of like, you know, what did you learn from your experience selling books? And I'm more just like, no, what kind of fuck shit were you up to? <laughs> you know, like yeah. what, what, what's the crazy stories? And so um, I want you to just give this whatever you want it to be. Um, obviously we get to choose and you're a good chooser. So um, yeah. I, I, I'll, I'll start out by asking you like how you got into the, the book business. But uh, after that, you can talk about your three summers. You can talk about summers Dude, after. My story, only a couple people know it. And it's one of the most badass things you've ever heard. Good. Save it. Save it for when we go live. But cool. uh, that's awesome. So if, if you don't want to talk about it, this, this is like what Andres always says. And I never understood why he like went out of his way to mention this. If there's anything that you don't want to talk about, just say, oh, that's a story for another time. Nobody's said that once. There, there is not a single thing that I won't be willing to talk about. That's what I know. Uh, about. <laughs> Truly uncensored. I hope, I hope you get to the things that make me extremely uncomfortable to talk about. I hope you get there. <laughs> that would be something to write home about, right? Yeah, this will be fun. That's funny. Okay. Braxton Amundsen's Ponytails. This is episode number 33, I believe. Am I following Brian Tallaby? Um, no, he was last Thursday. We had on Saturday, uh, Patrick Tullius. Oh, those are both of my arch nemeses. That's perfect. Ah. Also, it's pronounced Tallaby, believe it or not. Barang Tallaby. Barang Tallaby. <laughs> so, yeah, that's that's funny. You have arch nemeses. <laughs> I, know I just kind of make them up. Three. I don't. I don't think any of them are actually aware that they're my arch nemeses. <laughs> Lester. I'm putting specifically that you sold 7,300 units. Nice. Because you are your units. <laughs> nice. Dude, that's what I, I, I tell everyone that, and they all believe me. Yeah, like as if you did that one summer, right? Yeah. They're like, how many <laughs> units you sell? I'm like, oh, 7,300. That's so funny. Wow. And, okay, so I'm put Braxton sold books for three summers and is a total wild card. He sold 7,300 units. And what else? What else? What else? Oh, four, four Sizzlers in three summers. 
and hit four sizzler <laughs> and hit sizzler four times. <laughs> Three summers. Yeah. Um, let's see. <laughs> I'm going to love talking about that with you. You got to post something about the uncensored page. It was the inspiration of the creation of the Southwestern page. This is going to be, this is going to be really good. Oh, dude. As soon as we go live, by the way, I'm going to have you post this onto, uh, your, your my own page. And I don't know exactly how I do that. That's fine. I'll coach you through it. Okay. Cool. The coloration on my webcam gets off, and then I like put my thumb and it fixes it. It's weird. So you're gonna go live in the alumni page? Is that how it works? Nope. We have our own Ponytails podcast page. Um, oh, cool. And then we cross post from there. What a genius idea. What a Are you able to turn your camera sideways just to get the full perfect, much more visually pleasant? You may have to stack it on top of something. I don't know. Got a got a nice down up view right there. Good. Ponytails. Have you gotten Dimitri on yet? No, he and I got on a Facebook spat recently, but um, I think he and I could, you know, continue in one of these. That that's a good idea. I'll, I'll definitely reach out to him. He doesn't like liberals. No, and that's not me. I am I am not a liberal. I am further left. I'm a libertarian oh. by nature, right? Libertarian leftist, but I don't, I don't, it's, it's all bullshit. You know, it's labels. All right. So you're like, I'm further left. I am. Yeah. Liberals, neoliberals are just like terrible. They play identity politics. They don't actually help people. You know, they they go for divide to then conquer instead of unite to take care, you know? Yeah, so um, a bunch of evidence just came out. Derek Chauvin is most likely going to be um, uh, acquitted on mistrial. Yeah, dude. Yeah. I, uh, I remember the Maxine Waters info and hearing about how she, like, unduly influenced everything. And I was like, man, that's it's not smart. <laughs> There's there's evidence coming out that several of the jurors were Black Lives Matter activists, mm -hmm. um, which actually has me think, um, you know, I was telling some friends, I'm like, Chauvin's about to get, you know, acquitted, all hell's going to break loose. And I think that part of them, they want Chauvin to be acquitted. Black Lives Matter matters, wants him to be acquitted because they, so they benefit off of the uproar. Right. Um, so it's, it's all okay. So you we are live on Facebook now, by the way, I sent that link for you. If you want to just throw it onto your Facebook real quick and even like put it on your Instagram, just so that people, I, I suppose it's not the easiest thing to click links on Instagram. It is not. So copy and then paste it into just paste it into post something. Yeah. Just say, Hey, okay. I watched the, <laughs> watch my live episode with Nick on ponytails. Up on, I have no idea. I have no idea what's about to happen. I mean, we're already talking about Derek Chauvin, like within the yeah. very first seconds of starting this episode on live, so. But I can promise you brilliance. Mm. Okay, posted. All right, let's do this. All right. Um, yeah. we'll okay, so let me introduce you. Um, to the audience here. Um, we've got two live viewers right now and we'll be having people trickle in. Thanks for sharing that. Um, hello and welcome everyone to Ponytails Podcast. I am one of your co-hosts, Nick Tiberti. Andre Scamboa Barrera is off doing some cool stuff, taking care of his, his life and spending time with some special people this week. So uh, it's just me and my really good friend Braxton. This dude is a hoot and a half. Um, I've known Braxton, um, you know, quite well since 2016. Um, 
that was like your your last summer selling books was 2015, wasn't it? Or was it 14? 14, 14. Okay. So yeah, the, there's there's a fun story there and how Braxton and I got to know each other. But um, Braxton sold 7,300 units. And he's just a like a, a legend within the alumni sphere just because he's he's a wild card. I, I keep saying this because um, he helped create the uh, Southwestern Alumni Uncensored page with our good friend Miles Ham, and uh, yeah, it's 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 fun the stories that Braxton has to share from his post Southwestern career. I'm sure he's got some from within his Southwestern career that are going to be fun to talk about. Um, he is a book writer. Um, he wrote a book called Let's Start a Cult. Um, and, you know, he, he's just like a champion of attitude and, you know, manifesting things in your life um, as taught by not just Southwestern, but also MITT, Mastery and Transformational Training, which Braxton was the one who roped me in to get me to do that some years ago. So um, honored to have you on here, Braxton. I, I could, you know, sing your praises even more, but I'll, I'll just kind of don't die down a little bit and just thank you for being here so welcome yeah i appreciate you having me on so i have no agenda right now i told you i'd come with an open mind and a and a welcoming heart so whatever uh direction um this goes i am excited for what comes up so thank you for having me cool man well i encourage you as you know this whole episode un unravels um to like you know feel inspired to go down any rabbit holes that you, you want to go down. Um, how I want to start this is I just want to hear about you. You kind of alluded to it um, when we first were chatting here on Zoom. Tell us about this like legendary story of how you got into books. Like it's oh my inspiring God. something, right? Yeah. So I was sitting in um, Irving's Cafe in Penn State. I was the only one there. I was sitting at a table just a small little cafe by myself. It was in the basement and I'm just on my computer doing some homework and coming down the staircase is this 320 pound man. And there's probably 10 other tables there. And he comes in and he sits directly across me and he goes, hi, my name's Lester. What's your name? <laughs> And I'm like, oh, this weirdo. I'm like, my name's Braxton. I'm like, okay, I'm just going to ignore him until he goes away. I'm just going to ignore him until he goes away. And he proceeds to stare at me for five minutes and doesn't say anything. It's just silence. And, and I'm, I'm not even doing anything on my computer. I'm literally just doing this. I'm just acting like I'm typing. And for five minutes, I'm so uncomfortable. And, and he breaks the silence by going, Braxton, do you think I'm attractive? And now I'm like, okay, I don't want to hurt this guy's feelings. Uh, um, you know, maybe he'll kill me if I'm not nice to him or whatever. So I answer around the question. I'm like, you know, everyone's attractive in their own way. And he sits there and he looks me dead in the eye. He goes, Braxton, I don't work with liars. Do you think I'm attractive? And I'm like, speechless. I, I'm, I'm not a person to become speechless, but I'm speechless. And he like goes, look. I'm not attractive. I'm 320 pounds. My name's Lester for God's sakes. And then he reaches into and pulls up a backpack and he pulls out a magazine and sets it on the table, opened up to a United Airlines ad. And there's a girl that's a model. Um, and she's uh, modeling as like a flight attendant for United Airlines. He goes, but this is my wife. If you work with me this summer, I'll teach you how to marry up. And I was like, this guy knows something that I don't. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, he, know, he clearly knows something that I don't. I don't know what, what you're doing, but I'm in. It was one of the biggest power moves that I've, I've ever seen. I've ever experienced in my entire life. I was just baffled. I was mind blown. And it's funny because I've been friends with Lester for about 10 years. Yeah. And I always bring it up. I'm like, yo, Lester, still single, bro. <laughs> still single. You, you, you didn't told me, shit. <laughs> you told me you're not a man of your word. Um, <laughs> it's been just this ongoing joke, which actually is funny because that actually comes into, you know, the MITT portion of this on my 26th birthday, 26th birthday. Yeah, it was my 26th birthday. Lester calls me in a panic. And he's just like, oh my God, 
uh, do you remember that conversation that we had five years ago? And I'm like, yes, I do. Unforgettable. Yeah. And he's like, I found it. I found how I'm going to teach you how to, how, how to marry up in life. You got to come to Los Angeles. You got to take this training. <laughs> and I'm like, fuck it. This guy has never led me wrong before. <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> so that is kind of how I've been roped into all the cults that I've been roped into is the, the cult leader of all cult leaders. Um, and what, I, I mean, I mean, man, seriously, like my book is let's start a cult, the power of radical belief. Like what a man to take leadership from, like for, for cult like purposes, like <laughs> he is the master cult leader. Uh, we so. love Lester, man. He's, he's just a, a wacky, wise, loving teddy bear. That's like got a lot of ideas, right? I love Lester and I miss him sometimes. So. I do want to give shout out to Dave Kleifkin because Dave Kleifkin actually is my student manager. God damn it. Why do people call me at the most inconvenient times? <laughs> anyway, Dave Kleifkin is my student manager. He basically, he, he did recruit me. Um, the story of Lester just happens to be the one that's a little more out outlandish. Yeah. So it's the one that does get told. So I will throw shout out to Dave Kleifkin best student manager i could have possibly asked for you could probably um, get him on a, on a podcast episode yeah oh yeah he's he, he'd be a great guest um so so yeah so that's how i that's how i got into this uh magical cult so magical man so i i'm just kind of curious you know you were just hanging out oh, i i want to know like how how that first summer went this is what i love hearing about people's experiences like how they actually got into the fold because how did it wind up that you were recruited and trained by dave if lester said that to you is that like your first experience from someone with southwestern did you know dave prior to lester or how'd that work i i, I knew dave prior to lester um and dave was a full-time recruiter yeah. on the penn state campus um so lester was one of the DSMs, Lester was under Brandon, who, or I'm sorry, Dave was under Brandon, who was under Lester. Yep. So um, Lester was coming to do a campus visit and yep. happened to have been there. This weird interaction happened. I'm under Dave and I love Lester and Dave. And I'm like, okay, cool. I don't know what I'm doing this summer, but it's going to be great. And then my, my first or second day on the book field, I actually totaled my car. Um, and I, I was in the, uh, I was in um, Blackwell, Oklahoma, uh, um, which is in the middle of nowhere. I, I totaled my car. I was driving so fast. I was like, gotta get my 30 demos. Yeah. I'm, I'm behind. I'm on this, I'm on this dirt road and I just lose control of my car, total my car. I'm in the hospital. I, I didn't get my 30 demos that day. Um, but uh, I was in the hospital got picked up at the hospital and guess what? I'm a walker for the rest of the summer. So yes. Um, uh, yeah, my first summer was great. I finished right around 2000 units. Um, all of my summers were around 2000 units. Uh, yeah. Despite it saying that I'm a 7,300 unit producer, that's the total number of units that, that, that I sell. And that's the number that I choose to tell people. They ask me, Hey Braxton, how many units did you sell? I said 7,300. It was you that failed to ask what time frame. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> People always say, how many units do you sell? I tell them how many, how many units I sold. Hey, I, so, did, I did the numbers too. I sold 7,300 units just about. Dude, it's, it's genius. <laughs> we are so, um, the same. Yeah. So uh, it's funny, like, like people will, will like, it's, I'll usually, it's usually like the active book people, like people that are post Southwestern don't, don't really care, yeah, but the sure. active book, book people I love to fuck with. I'm like, yeah, I sold 7,300 units and they like, listen to me. Like I have the most important words to say because I did something cool when I was in college. Um, <laughs> and uh, I don't know. It's just always been, I, I always just had fun with it. And yeah, I don't know. Life, life has Southwestern has, despite what I may have said or not have said on the uh, Southwestern uncensored page. Uh, I really, and where I'm at today because of what I learned knocking doors with Southwestern. And I, I'm really appreciative and grateful for the experience. I think of a lot of the people that have gone through Southwestern, I probably have some of the lowest, like disc, you know, like the lowest grievances. Yeah. Uh, just because my, 
I learned something super valuable every single year. And I was actually never upset with Southwestern. I just thought it was funny to post on the page. Um, <laughs> people yeah. believe it. They're like, oh my God, he's talking bad about this thing. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> um, no, I like my third summer was 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 a roller coaster ride and it was the farthest thing from smooth. Um, my last week on the book field was my best week of my career. Positive. Um, I had a, a 300 unit day uh, my last Ooh. week. Um, I was going nowhere that summer. Um, that was about to be like a complete disaster. And I pulled out, you know, the really strong, like three week finish. And I ended up having my best summer by like maybe 75 units. Nice. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was, I was like, wow. Like I, and I, I, I think finishing on the pop as a note, the way that I did really had sparked a lot that I took into, I went, went right into book buying. Uh, I was with, went right into RTB with um right out of southwestern and i i had my confidence was up like i went i went from being just like this kind of nobody kid that you know just just sold like a couple thousand units to like wow i was the top producer in a company like i was the top producer in rtb for like i don't know three years straight um i brought on a lot of people from southwestern into you know into rtb i had a, a really solid base what does RTB stand for? Because I know recycle a book. It's recycle a textbook. That's what I thought. Um, yeah, the, basically <laughs> they just like copied their name. <laughs> it's a total the business model. The, neither of the com- I don't. I'm not aware. I don't think either of the companies exist anymore. Um, Ray lawsuits. I, I think. Uh, well, <laughs> we will not speak about that. Uh, we will not speak about that. Just hey, like, I hit. I, I hit a wall that you can't go past. So yeah, I'm not yeah. talking about that. <laughs> um, there was a lawsuit involved um, with me, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, then I ended up going and doing books on my own. Uh, did my own thing, listed them on Amazon, brought a bunch of people on. Um, kind of, I don't know, like a lot of this stuff just started like the entrepreneurial work and just like learning learning first and then going and making it my own later. And I mean, I did books up until about a year ago, um, as recent as a year ago when, uh, I mean, I actually just so, uh, sold some books on Amazon today. So um, I still have, you know, people that, that hit me up for books, but I don't actively go out and knock on doors or anything. Right, right. Real quick for anybody who's like totally unaware of what Braxton's talking about. There was like, factions of people who sold books for southwestern that kind of went off and wound up creating book buying programs where they would go to you know students in college when they're done with finals week they got all these textbooks that they may or may not own um and they don't have they don't have a perceived use for them so um what braxton and all these other people in these companies would do is they just give them cash and say i'll buy that from you and so they would buy these books to then go sell them on Amazon and all the other uh, book selling websites to sell these textbooks and turn them. Out. Yeah, a lot of people, a lot of people get that mixed up because it's like, oh, is that Southwestern? Like, it, they're both books, but they're completely different jobs. Oh yeah. Um, but yeah, so I I did that, and then um, I don't know, I, I made a bunch of money. Like my first my first full year, like right out of Southwestern, I made like 130 grand doing book buying and I'm like one of the most frugal people in the world despite what my wardrobe might say like I it it looks like I wear really expensive clothes like if you look at my Instagram um, those clothes are actually really really um, affordably found Um, like I tell people that they're like designer clothes and all this stuff but like honestly like my suit jackets are no more than eighty dollars, and my shoes you are find no them more than like Indian tailors that do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, but they look they look really good, and like people always compliment me on them. But oh, I'm like Jackson, so flashy. <laughs> yeah, I'm like the most frugal person on the planet. So like this first year, I I I made like hundred and thirty grand, and I saved hundred and ten of it. Wow. And I just like invested it into, uh, I bought a house, I invested into some cryptos. Um, I maxed out my retirement funds and I started like building, you know, my, my portfolio. And I just kept like stockpiling money in my early twenties. Um, so what I'm doing now, since books have been gone for about a year, um, I have 
uh, I just launched my eighth Airbnb property. Um, so I do the whole um, uh, rental arbitrage business and um, I just do up homes, decorate homes and it's passive income. I mean, it's- Are you at one right now? I'm not, I'm, I'm actually at a friend's house right now. Um, You're in uh, California? No, I'm in Massachusetts. No way, where in? Mm -hmm uh waltham which is a suburb of boston yeah dude i uh i didn't spend any like considerable time selling in that part of massachusetts but if you go inland just an hour not even that's where i sold for two of my first summers so like framingham um so i i sold in uh sutton douglas um there's a uh, webster uh massachusetts. oh i know I, I know that yeah, Webster, Massachusetts is home to the. I Walmart. actually went on a date with a girl from Webster, Massachusetts. And uh, Webster, Mass, right? That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I actually am proud of what I know about Webster is how to pronounce their lake name, which is the longest lake name in the world. It's Lake Chargagagag Van Chagagag Chumbunagungamag. That's impressive. Yeah, that's so, solidly impressive. Dude, it was like when I was sitting down with families, I'd be like, okay, all right. So I just, I'm from Nebraska and like I'm a college student and I love this area. It's great turf, you know, and all the people are education conscious. And like the lake name here, Lake Chargagag, Chow, Lake, <laughs> Lake Chargagagag. I totally mess it. I, it's, it's blanking. Chargagagag, man, Chargagag, Chabunagungamag. And they'd be like, you can say it. Whoa, we can't even say it. We live here, you know? Dude, that reminds me of, um, have you ever seen uh, Forgetting Sarah Marshall? I have, yeah. It's uh, it's like, he's like, he says he knows like all the names of the fish. It's like, what's the state fish of high? Nikki, Nikki, Pua, Tua, Ahua. <laughs> yes, yes. The, uh, the it runs in the fish. same thing. Um, but yeah, so no, I'm in Massachusetts right now. Um, That's dope. Uh, going back, I, I'm actually in Florida. Uh, most of my time is spent in Florida between Max Orlando and... Orlando and Tampa primarily. I love. Um, I, I do spend a lot of time in Jacksonville. Cool. Um, times were times were kind of tough at the end of last year. I was run, I was cash flow poor, and so I was the, um, in the months of January, February, and March. I was the number one Postmates driver in the world. There you go. Um, yeah, I'm very proud of that. In three months, I pulled out twenty nine thousand dollars in Postmates driving, which That's I didn't even know that was possible. <laughs> That's like selling six thousand units, bro. Yeah, um, no, it was it was legit. I I was like I was literally just driving around, and I was just like seventeen hour days. Like I would wake up in the morning at seven a.m. and I would drive until one a.m. <laughs> and I was just like fucking jamming it i'm like i'm getting out of like debt i'm getting out of debt um because covid like i mean just like everybody like covid was rough man and i was like covid set me back like a lot of my books um they devalued i had them on amazon and they just devalued and i lost a bunch of money yeah. um so i was like okay i'm i'm earning this cash back drive 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 and then I got my back end check with uh, with Vivint and I had stacked up all this cash and I just like dumped it all into Airbnbs and then crypto started popping and I was like, yeah. life is good. But I feel like I'm Donald Trump. You know what I mean? Yeah, Donald right. Trump You're has, a serial has entrepreneur. That... What? You're a serial well, entrepreneur. I, I specifically mean like Donald Trump in the mid nineties when he was like going bankrupt and it's just <laughs> like, and then he had like this epic comeback. I'm just like, dude, yeah, I'm just it. taking right after, right after my, my, uh, my hero my heroic icon no 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 no, no no don't pretend like it's not jeb <laughs> dude i we need jeb back man <laughs> yeah not jeb but jeb 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 gotta say it with the exclamation point right you cannot forget his ex did you ever see the um there's a musical out um and they took all the songs from hamilton and they adapted it into a 2016 uh presidential um, run for Jeb. It's called Jeb the Musical. No. Oh my God. How could a bastard orphan son of a George and a Barbara? Oh, dude, it's so great. Like, <laughs> um, it's so great. Wow. You, like, it's 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 an entire five five page like whole thing. Wow. Um, wow. Uh, tell tell me what is it that uh, you know 
when when you say something really good and you need some applause what please what clap no yeah no there's something else that like a whole what is it you know what i'm talking about what did he say before that now here's my pledge to you i will be a commander in chief that will have the back of the military i won't trash talk i won't be a divider in chief or an agitator in chief i won't be out there blowharding talking a big game i think our next president needs to be a lot quieter but sends a signal that he's prepared to act in the national security interest of this company country to get back in the business of creating a more peaceful world please clap please clap <laughs> that, oh that's it gosh. dude yeah. I'm it's so funny like we have this like little me and my uh my team down uh we all do airbnb together um so some we, we have some people that do like the construction part of it um you know some people do the decorating part of it so we have this like whole little team there's like there's like six of us and we all have the same humor so uh, we all do the we all like love Jeb Bush videos. Um, we all love Donald Trump videos. Like Donald Trump on WWE is one of the funniest things I've ever seen. <laughs> it's so funny. Um, but we all have like the exact same humor and the exact same inside jokes. Like if someone, if someone from the outside ever like came into like one of the projects, they would be so confused at like what we're saying. Cause a lot of it is either Jeb Bush related or it's Donald Trump related or it's, like there's there's this one thing so i had a friend and i'm not going to say his name he's actually a southwestern friend um but uh he was moving and he asked me to come move, come help him move and i said yeah i would and i said yeah what would, would, would you mind if i borrowed the u-haul after um after you know we're done moving he's like yeah it's fine so i help him move for eight hours eight hours I'm hauling stuff. He's like from the third floor of an apartment. I'm like hauling boxes down and stuff, getting the U-Haul. It's like eight o'clock at night. We're finally done. I'm like, all right, cool. Can I borrow the U-Haul? And he's like, yeah, yeah. Just pay me 20 bucks for the day. And I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> and uh, the, the motherfucker, I paid him $20 to help, to him, help move. him move. <laughs> so so it's funny like we have this whole culture where it's like if you do me a favor i'm always just like okay cool that'll be 20 bucks <laughs> that's funny it's it's a fun joke it's yeah. a fun joke so uh we're, we're kind of all over the place with this episode braxton i'm gonna read yeah, it's great. a little bit um because I, I could shoot the shit with you all day man uh, it's good to see you again and, um you know i i don't know do you want to what what's kind of like a, a thing that you want to focus on um are you, are you wanting to talk about your Southwestern career or like the post Southwestern career? Man, I, I don't know if my career. Southwestern career is super relevant to really anything. Yeah. Um, it was more of a, a stepping stone that got me started. And it definitely is completely, um, completely uh, like supportive at, you know, at, at me getting to where I'm, I'm at right now. Absolutely. But a lot of my post, is happy to if, if people want to know um some stuff that i took away from southwestern uh the mindset stuff is is the most important thing i think um really mindset is is what we're going to carry through to you know to anything whether it be our business or our relationships or our health uh the mindset stuff that i got from southwestern was undeniably great and I have some specific questions about mindset. Yeah, yeah, um, go, go for it. From our number one fan, Angie Quinones, right? I sent you these questions. Um, what's been like your your favorite self talk, whether even to this day or like when you were selling books? When I was selling books, I was I was doing self talk to do it as a thing to do, and I wasn't really embodying it or believing it. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, man, I don't, there's not really like one self-talk. I think I'm just so in check with like what's coming here. And I, and I would usually just repeat it. Like I watched um, one of the things that I do say quite often came from uh, watching South Park. Actually, mm -hmm. um, I was watching the Kanye West episode and he's like, I'm a genius. I'm the voice of a generation. And I like always find myself saying I'm the voice of a generation. Like I, I say that all the time. Um, and I really, and I really like to 
the point, like I, I started embodying it and believing it. it. I started saying it kind of like a joke, but then I just kept repeating it and repeating it and repeating it, which really goes to show like how powerful words are. Like words really have meaning. Absolutely. And, 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 and like what I found is like people that have like self deprecating humor. And I think that a lot of times in Southwestern, I had the whole self deprecating humor thing going. And I started to believe the things that I, the, the jokes that I said about myself. Um, and, and I've learned that like, self-deprecating humor is nothing that ever serves and and I just kind of like left that behind um because it was funny I got some laughs people people were entertained but just like Chris Farley it's like at the expense of who right Mm -hmm. so R.I.P. Chris Farley like he was a very funny person but it was always at the expense of himself so I left that self-deprecation behind because I've learned how important like what we're saying is like um the like the 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 beliefs that I've had a lot of it is about money and this is actually something that um I think is a a negative that Southwestern offers that a lot of people aren't aware of um is the idea that making thirty thousand dollars in the summertime is really good like it's training people to believe like oh my god I made thirty thousand dollars dust off his last summer and he's like um you know like we're, we're going to sign up for like another course and nick's like i made thirty thousand dollars in my college internship and he was and i was just like i don't want to be around him right now <laughs> you, you cut up there that. for a second i'm not sure if it was my connection or or yours but, oh uh, no I, I was saying like like he like proudly proclaimed that he made thirty thousand dollars in the summertime did? nick and um me no nick warner Oh, I didn't hear any names. And, so, yeah. yeah, so so he he was like, I made, and, I, and, and we're around like Tony Robbins people, people that are making like millions of dollars a year. And I'm just like, get this guy away from me. I don't want to be associated with him. Um, but, uh, but I think that that's one of the things that Southwestern actually does to the mind is it, is it actually caps uh, a belief barrier about money that um, that people have the opportunity to break through afterwards. Because like, I'm at this point in my life where I can feasibly see a possibility of making uh seven figures in a year and when i was like when i was just at a southwestern and i made a hundred thousand dollars i thought it was like the craziest thing ever i was just like whoa i'm like the richest person in the world um yeah but (laughs) but but like but like in in all reality like i said i made twenty nine thousand dollars in three months driving a car for postmates like and like I literally have now, am now in the mindset that like any idiot can make a hundred thousand dollars if they want to. If they just um, put in the work, yeah. If they just if they just put in the work. So like those were like belief barriers with money that I actually had to break through because of the idea that like I crushed it this summer. I made twenty five thousand dollars. Is is actually like doing some scarcity things to the mind and and training people to believe loan you know yeah. and it's it's not it's not about the money it really isn't it's about the possibilities that That's people amazing. can create and 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 it's like it's never about the money but it's about the impact that we can have on other people and um you know truth be told um you know truth be told there people the people that have the most influence in the world are the richest people in the world mm-hmm. whether that influence is good whether the influence is bad they are the ones that have for better or for worse have the most influence. Yep. So, um, you know, getting ourselves to a place where we can make a bigger impact on people. And like, I was actually talking to, um, to a friend yesterday, um, about, he's like, kind of like in a, in a, in a state of mind where he was like kind of depressed and he's just like, yeah, I just really don't like how the whole world is all about just like making money and stuff. I'm like, you're kind of close. You're close. It's not about making money. It's about adding as much value as possible. Like when I'm adding value to people's lives, it will be followed by money in my bank account. Every right? time? Just not every time. Um, okay. There's actually, so, there's so actually. Is it, is it actually value then? Mm, um, or is it's, it it's, opportuni- it's, opportunistic value? Like, you know, you, something that's valued at a certain level today might not lose its value in actual function, but like in perceived function, it would lose its value over time, right? That's depreciation that applies to, 
driving your car off the the auto lot right mm -hmm. i don't know i don't know if that i don't know if there's truth to what you're saying braxton i think so there's some additional words to put there something that i've learned is people don't pay me what they think i'm worth people pay me what i think i'm worth they think they think i'm worth more than what they're paying me other otherwise they wouldn't be paying me that you know that amount so sure. it's about me it's 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 about owning my worth price. Yeah. Yeah. It's about owning my worth and learning to, you know, to ask more. Like, you know, when, when I was in Southwestern, I thought, oh my God, I sold a, I sold a, a six book set, which is like 600 bucks. Right. And like, I, I don't know the last time I made a sale that was only as small as 600 bucks. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, so I'm like, you, you know, it's just like learning to ask more like a solar project deal that I just completed with my dad was like $48,000. Um, commission on that was almost 10 grand uh, thanks dad you know <laughs> yeah thanks dad um so you know so like it's about like learning to to really just dive in and, and like have like the intimate connection with somebody in a way that they trust you with their you know with their resources like sales is all about like engaging with someone and in and cultivating trust and it's like, do I trust this person to write a check for $200 or do I trust this person to run my credit and, you know, and, and basically take out a $48,000 loan that I'm going to be responsible for, for the next 21 years. And it's like, as we grow and mature, you know, the, the, the game gets harder and our skills get greater. So I love, I love that you're talking about that because you're, you're just identifying the bigger plays that get to be had when you invite yourself into that space. And mm -hmm. this is why I'm eternally grateful for you insisting on me doing MITT, both basic and advanced, man. Like that's, that's just how the players of the world think by choice, right? Because they don't want, they, they see what limits them and then they just kind of skirt around it and then just see what's possible and they go out and do stuff like i don't know earn thirty thousand dollars from postmates just to get out of debt right i mean it, it's it's what you're talking about with possibility and everything that's that's incredible um because it's it's just solving different problems right so do yeah, you I have a favorite problem solving like story this is another question that was asked to be asked to you, whether from books or from any of these bigger games that you're choosing to play. I mean, man, there's like my, my life is problem solving. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> there's not a specific story that I can that I can think of per se, but it's like, man, any time that I that I come into a situation like what I've learned is leaders see obstacles as opportunities and and really the, the, the biggest thing that I can think of and the biggest obstacle that I ever faced was when uh, I woke up in the morning, my dad calling me to tell me that my sister-in-law commit suicide. Yeah. And I was like, you know, the whole weight of the world just crashed on me, like, boom. Um, I was like completely devastated, completely mortified. And I learned that like, hey, life throws me challenges only when I'm strong enough to face them. Sure. And the only way out is through. Um, and most people, what, what most people do in that circumstance is they close off their heart and they numb the pain. Yeah. And I learned, I'm like, no, I'm going to go through this head first. And I, you know, for, for, for a week straight, I wailed and cried my heart out. And I remember specifically thinking like, you know, I, I had a, I had a training that I was supposed to be at a week after that. Um, it was, uh, my first, uh, time that I was going to give like a, a public thesis speech and they were calling me they're like look you don't need to do this I'm like of course I don't I don't need to do this but I'm gonna do this because um I believe that um you know I don't they're like I, I was I specifically said I was like I don't want to be here I don't feel like being here but um I'm here because I stand for a world where no one has to experience what I experienced ever again and that people show up for each other because it's really the really life is about like our relationship with ourselves and others. Like that's really, really the whole meaning of life is just maintaining a healthy relationship with myself and others. And, and um, when I follow through 
with the things I say I'm going to do, I become stronger inside. When I follow through, um, you know, with my word, which is, I think, like in the whole Southwestern world, which I think why it's so important that that people uh, complete when they commit to doing something is their 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 trust in themselves begins to grow. And I've I've learned that like if I give my word, I you know that in this day and age it doesn't really mean much anymore, right? Um, 59% divorce rate. Um, people say until death do us part. And what they're actually saying is until death do us part or some type of circumstance happens. Right. That is, that is what happens in this day and age. And I dream of a world where we follow through with our commitments and we're willing to do the work with ourselves and, and the people around us. And what I've learned is like, people are just feedback. How you show up to me is feedback for how I'm being with you. And it's up to me to facilitate a new relationship with you if something's not working. And we're, we're in like the throwaway stage, like in the, in the 90s when computers were new and your computer was broken, you used to take it to a computer repair shop. And now you throw it away and you get a new one. And we're doing the same thing with our relationships. We're throwing them away, discarding people and saying, Nick's toxic. I don't want to hang out with him anymore. Instead of saying, hey, Nick, Let's have a conversation. When, 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 we, when we hang out, you just seem X, Y, and Z with me. And I just want to know from you how I'm being um, that's causing this type of behavior. Like I'm not pointing fingers at you anymore. I'm taking ownership. I want to know from you, Nick, why, why is it that you're always so closed off when I'm around? Is there something that I'm doing? And then it leads to a real discussion right. because people like, I don't know. It's so funny. Like I, I just notice everything in the world around me when people just start yelling at other people. Like I had this guy yesterday, I, I made a left turn. I didn't use a turn signal. And he like followed me for a mile into a parking lot and was like, hey, and, and he, he started yelling at me and calling me stupid and stuff. And I was just kind of ignoring him. I, I walked into the store and he was still there and I walked out and he kept yelling at me and I walked over and I said, Hey, sir, am I the one that's stupid? Um, for not using a turn signal or are you the one that's stupid for yelling like incoherent words at a person that's not going to listen to heated emotion like which one which behavior is really stupid and i'm like <laughs> i'm not i'm not like calling you stupid or anything i'm just inviting you to communicate like i'm sorry i probably should be using my turn signal i was like and and, and thank you for like letting me know that but if you really want to get your point across, like, have you ever been in a situation where someone is like, stop doing that? I'm the authority. And then you do it more. Like, you know what I mean? Like, like I do it all the time. If someone is like commanding and, and like, you can't do that. And I'm like, I, I literally am doing it right now. So you're wrong because you're telling me that I'm not able to do something that I'm currently doing. So like, I like, I'll get like defiant. Um, but I, but I like, as I've like grown, I've like checked in with my emotions and I'm like, people will just yell like abhorrent, like phrases at people. And, and like, they're actually trying to get a, a point across that would make the, the, you know, in this case would make the road safer, but he's yelling it in a way that is like not making me want to listen. So that's, that's where we're at in this world where it's like, Nick, I'm just so fucking sick and tired of you doing this and, and you know and, the, and then our relationship just goes to trash instead of like having an open discussion and like that is the value of really the value of like what I've learned with sales is just if you go through the sales script like intro you know buying atmosphere you know the the you know all, all of that stuff and in the close and like translating that into my life is just having you know having an open discussion having the buying atmosphere mm -hmm. hey nick man you you can do whatever you want um you're, you're my friend and i just want to have a working health healthy relationship with you so uh, you know like that's a total buying atmosphere and like that's been one of the most valuable things that i can see you know in you know in in my life and it's applicable not even not even in the business not just in the business world it's applicable everywhere yeah it's, uh, it's, it's interesting that you say that because, uh, you know, I, I personally love having learned the extreme ownership of just being like, hey, if something's off in this relationship, instead of blame, 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 let me just seek to understand by taking ownership and saying, I, I, I know that I can control me. So 
how should I change, right? How can I improve this relationship? Because if I were to, you know, tell you all of how you can improve, I mean, it, it just, it's ignorant of the fact that I'm the only person I can control. And yeah. So. Yeah. One of the, one of the most powerful things I did in my entire life was after a, after a breakup, um, I was in Hawaii and I was sitting on the beach and I was, I was journaling, you know, after, you know, a tough breakup, like a tough heartbreak, there's some, you know, necessary decompressing time um, to take place. And well, some people just go right into another relationship and don't learn anything. Um, most people actually. Um, but I, you know, was taking some time to decompress. I was in Hawaii sitting on the beach and I was reading through my journal. And every time I wrote another person's name, I would cross out the sentence and I'd rewrite the sentence. So if I wrote like, Nick lied to me, I crossed it out and I wrote, I didn't create a relationship with Nick where he felt safe to tell me the truth. Like mm -hmm. you did lie to me, right? In this case, like Nick did lie to me, but why did Nick lie? Nick lied maybe because he thought I was going to judge him, right? Maybe because he thought, you know, like think about like the summertime, for example, like in Southwestern, when people lie about their stats, they probably think um, from the management, they're going to be judged for having a zero day or judged for, you know, for this. And it's like the first years are lying about their stats, but that's a result of management, like, um, you know, feeling may, maybe feeling like controlling or, or whatever. And like, if people just had an open discussion, I ran into this uh, last summer when I was working with Vivint um, is I never lied. I actually thought it was hilarious when I, when I just broke the rules, like, and I just like would tell them about it. They're like, you have to ride to and from turf with your, uh, you know, your with your car trip driver. And I would but I would park my car in turf. <laughs> <laughs> I literally read the rules and they're like, Hey, you, we, we heard that you're driving your car around. I'm like, yeah, I am. And they're like, you have to ride to and from turf with your car group driver. I'm, I do every single week. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, yeah. but how do you drive your car? I'm like, I park my car in turf. <laughs> um, so, so like I've learned to just be like brutally honest with people. And cause like really, I, I, in the conversation I had with the managers, Hey, look, um, I don't work for you. You actually work for me. Um, you're, you know, you're, you're people that are here. You're my sales manager. You're here to manage my sales and make sure that I'm doing the best that I can. So it's not my job to follow your rules. It's your job to it's communicate fine. with me. And I use you as a tool and, and you know, when I choose to, and right now I'm not choosing to use your leadership because it's not serving me. Um, and, and they're just like, but, 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 but. <laughs> and, and I'm like, I'm sorry, but like, you can't out Jedi the Jedi master. Uh, <laughs> Damn Braxton, you're such a, oh, you're, you're an extreme owner. That's for sure. It, it, I mean, it was, it, it's when I came to that realization, I'm like, I don't need, I don't need to lie to my leaders. Um, they're here for my benefit and, and, um, that but, but like most of most sales organizations they run with so much control like management has so much control in the organization where it's like you're a bad person if you're if you're off schedule and i mean i've been off schedule every year in my book you know i sold fucking 2000 units every summer of course i was off schedule but well, it's like 7300 units oh yeah true i forgot about that oh, um, yeah <laughs> uh 7300 yeah but um, no, I, I, I mean, there was times where I was like super off schedule and I identified myself as like a bad person that's never going to make it in life. And it was like this whole fear based, you know, this whole fear based. Um, my my DSM was a big time fear bit fear fear monger. And um, that was Brandon. We won't say his name. <laughs> yeah, I was a gunslinger. So you can figure it out. Um, yeah but he was a big time fear monger. And I literally thought there were times where he, I literally thought I'm like, Oh my God, I want to go to the movie theater. And I'm like, what if, what if he's driving around and he sees like, I literally thought he was like following me around. Term. That's crazy. <laughs> so I never, I like never got like that off schedule. While I was going to the movies. I always thought about it, but I'm like, Ooh, he's going to see my car. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe he lowjacked my car, oh, but it's gosh. like, that's, that's what happens when, when leadership is, is fear mongering is it implants this idea in my mind. And, and like, that's not a healthy thought for a salesperson to be having. Mm -hmm. 
no. um, but it's the un unfortunate thought. And, the, and truth be told, really the unfortunate part of fear mongering and control in sales in sales management is it does get short term results. Yeah. And, and that's actually the worst side effect of it is the fact that it works. And, and it works the to the detriment of the long term of the long term relationship, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, where like, I mean, even when I was book buying, like I would get a call, hey man, how'd you do today? And I'm like, it would sound like it did it didn't sound like um it didn't sound like, hey, I care about you and I want you to do well. It sounded like, how much money did you make me today? <laughs> like that's what it sounded like. And I'm like, God, it's so annoying. Um, but it, and, and, and it, it really isn't, it's not what you say, it's how you say it, right? Um, that's something that I learned in Southwestern. It's not what you say, it's how you say it. And like, I can say, I mean, there, there's a dog here and I, and I can be like, oh, you stupid, dumb dog. Oh, I love you. Know, right? you know, or, I, or I can be like, you fucking great dog. I fart. And, and, and the dog's going to respond to how I'm saying the words, not the words themselves, because like, that's, I, I mean, how we communicate and our intention is is 80 percent of the communication itself what do they say like 80 percent of communication is nonverbal. So it's you're how i'm being, holding myself how i'm being with somebody yeah um, you so know and how I'm, you know, that uh like southwestern management for example kind of instilled this fear both intentionally and unintentionally um you know just because they're kind of passing on that same mindset from their sales manager and it just it's mm -hmm. part of the culture right and you've yeah, seen and in other cultures where it's just like it does, it gets like daily results that are kind of low low lower than what they could be maximal maximally but also long term you're going to get resentment and people leaving by choice and it's all like uh, i'm going to scratch and claw you just to you know make it feel bad for leaving in the first place you know and, and that's the thing. That's the thing in the culture, in the Southwestern culture. It's just like, if someone leaves, like they get, it's like, it's so odd what happens in the culture. It's like they get gossiped about in a way that like they are a failure for the rest of life. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it, you know what I mean? It's just like, Oh, he's. So Nick. I, I find that interesting because obviously that's been a, a very common experience actually. Um, and Lord knows I got fired from Southwestern and I about that. yeah, dude. And I actually have done nothing but hung out with Southwestern people, like current Southwestern people. My roommates are Danny Johnston and Nick Chavez, and they're about to go off for another summer tomorrow. Um, and I lived with Shane Blick and his roommates, Alex Har and Lane Serrato, who are, they're going to sell books this summer in Toria a prior book girl. So um, it's it's interesting how that plays out because I haven't experienced the like total shunning, if you will. It's I find it just hard to get their attention because they're so busy and like they're really bad at follow up because of that. And it makes me feel like I'm being shunned, but no, they're just selling books eight hours a week and then recruiting a hundred hours a week and then traveling two weeks out of the year and they don't want nothing else but their own little cult to, to care about on a daily basis. Yeah. I, I, um, man, I have, I was not put on this earth and, and like, I love, it's so weird. <laughs> I know where it's you're going with this. Go on. It's such a weird thing. I, I was not put on this work on this earth to work all of my waking hours of my day exactly like and, and and like there's different kinds of income and this is kind of what i'm learning right now is like making eighty thousand dollars working versus making eighty thousand dollars collecting mailbox money there are two different kinds of making eighty thousand dollars one's you know one's better than the other sure. um and and it's like the principles that we're learning and the idea of um and the idea of um, and the idea of like working hard yeah. to get ourselves ahead, that's really important, but it's like, at what point do we stop? At what point do we stop? And do we switch into, um, you know, managing what we have and, and having our money work for us? It's something. At what point um, do yeah. we level up perhaps? Yeah. Because we level I, up. I think work never stops. I mean, this is a philosophical distinction. 
that Dan Moore talks about in one of his advanced sales is like, if work wasn't required, we would just sit around all day and watch everything work. We have to level up to that point is kind of what you're talking about is, you know, putting things on, you know, residual income, portfolio income, and, you know, um, you know, property based income that you get from yeah. rentals and stuff like that. But like the work never stops. You still have Having- all things you do in your relationships, work with yourself, work within, you know, everything else, you know, and I, I don't know. I, what are your thoughts on what I'm saying? My, how I look at it like this, my relationship with money is no different than my relationship with anyone else, right? That's cool. So, you know, it's just like Grant Cardone's book, Sell or Be Sold. Oh, we were listening um, to that in the car today, me and Mike Yonder. It's, it's a good one. Yeah. So it's, it's just like sell or be sold. I'm either a slave to money or money is a slave to me, yes. right? It's and it's, and it, it, it's one or the other. And the unfortunate truth is if someone's working 80 hours a week and they're grinding that way, then they are a slave to money. It doesn't matter if you're making $50,000 a year or $500,000 a year. If you're still putting in that much blood, sweat, and tears into, into it, you are a slave to money. You and when like Jeff, Be- yeah. Je- Jeff Bezos makes four decisions per day in his business Four. He's the richest man in the world makes four decisions per day and just trusts that his influence is, you know, is key. And then the rest of the time he's working on himself, just like what, yeah. what you said, he's working on himself. He's working on his relationships, which apparently he's doing very poorly because he's divorced. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I love when billionaires get divorced. I fucking love it. Uh, Bill Gates is excellent. <laughs> it's that money's not everything, right? Yeah. And, and I mean, Wait, and, did, and, no, did Bill and Melinda split up or something in the last mm-hmm. week? I haven't been paying attention. Mm-hmm. That's crazy. This is so good. It's so good. <laughs> it's, I'm, oh. I'm okay, good. Dark Brax. Dark Braxton is coming out. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, no, I it, it I think as our as our generation grows and our generation starts growing into, are you a millennial or are you a Z? I'm millennial. I'm okay. right before the end of the millennials. Okay. So as our generation starts getting into a place where we have influence, I think a lot of stuff is going to start um, taking place where people don't grind, you know, like they used to. And, and like not saying they won't in their 20s, because I do think that the, the learning, the commitment and the dedication and all that stuff, like completing several summers with Southwestern, that taught me so many things that I would not learn anywhere else. Um, but someone that's married with kids in their thirties, that going away and leaving your family. Like I was talking to one of my friends, Jorge, and I said, what's your dream? And he's like, I have a a two-year-old daughter. He's like, my dream, how, you know how we look at slavery and we're like, wow, I can't believe that people used to own slaves. He's like, I want my daughter to grow up in 15 years and go, wow, I can't believe that people used to go to work for 40 hours a week. And, and when, and when we can like shape that and we can change that, then people will have healthier relationships. People will have healthier bodies even. Um, Cause like, this. this is great. Yeah. How many people work 80 hours a week and don't take care of their body? I think, um, I think it's the Dalai yeah, Lama that says, I think it's a quote by the Dalai Lama that says like, um, what's the, what's the most confusing thing to you? And he said, man, because man sacrifices his health to make money. And then sacrifices his money to get his health back, and in all, and, and in the time, never really lives. And like, really, that's that's so true. Like, so many people do that. Like, I wasn't there for Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos's divorce. They just happened to have come up in conversation. But it's more likely than not that they were probably working their relationships away, and they're probably spending eighty hours a week away from their family and only getting like a, a little bit of time with their loved ones. And they just Definitely drifted apart. Elon and his relationship struggles, you know? Yeah, I, I like I said, I'm not there for any of them. I, I, I don't know any of those people. Um, sure. This is only yeah. mere speculation. Yeah. Um, I don't even know if Bill Gates' divorce is real. I have some conspiracy theories about that. Um, I, uh, I think that it's totally a publicity stunt in order for, you know, I don't know, whatever. For people that um, ties with Bill, right? <laughs> I, I'm not. I'm not going to comment. <laughs> Man, I'm actually using this a lot more than I thought I would. <laughs> we'll talk about this at a later date. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. 
So, yeah, I mean, all these people just working themselves to the bone and yeah, sacrificing. Yeah, and, I mean, good. sacrificing so many yeah. things that really matter. Like, like to me, um, I want to travel the world. I want to see the world. I, I've been to 50 countries. I'd like to go to all of them. There's 196 of them. Um, and I'm not going to be able to get there if I'm working my life away. And I want to get to a place where I can, you know, where I can make money, any where I can be um, location independent. And I can, you know, I can manage, make money through a couple phone calls, through a couple messages on my phone um, so that I can be present and actually see what, what there's so many things to see out there. There's so many people to meet out there. I, I've, I've learned to speak parts of 10 different languages and, you know, traveling. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, traveling and meeting different people of all different walks of life. And I wouldn't be able to do that if I was just so focused on, you know, grinding my life away. And like, once I learned to take a couple steps back, I actually, you know, I actually learned to be even more productive with, you know, with earning. Yeah. Do you think, uh, you know, all these people who grind their face off for, you know, nine of the 12 months of the year and then like i'm gonna go travel for the remaining three months like what you're describing is kind of just like what where are we going right now what's going on with your uh plugging my phone in okay cool i'm like we're on a we're on a wild ride here so um yeah with um with people who you know they work real hard real excuse me they work real hard for nine months like Southwestern preaches, and then they go and live their life as you're talking about for three. Um, it's it's interesting because all you're describing right now is, hello, cleaning lady, thank you, thank you for doing your work. Um, <laughs> all you're describing is balance, right? In a sense, right? And, and it's striking a balance in your lifestyle where you're not concerning yourself with things that tax you. And I mean, you're big on, avoiding taxes i know um and you just want to just want to live freely right that's that's this concept of freedom and you know all that stuff and living life unencumbered um you know but what they teach in southwestern right and what i've heard so many of these book people talk about is the like paradox of balance or something like that and how it's not actually real and if you go all in for a season you can go all in to lead it's it's the double time part time for full time free time notion right and i see you shaking your head i yeah I kind of agree with you um i don't know what, what are your thoughts on how that's so ingrained in not just the southwestern world i mean you, you kind of have been talking about it for a minute here it, I mean, it, it, it's not like, it's not, I've been in so many different worlds and it's all the same. It's not just a Southwestern thing. It's, it's a, it, you know, I, I worked with Vivint for a year and um, they're like, oh yeah, we only really work like, you know, three months of the summertime. I'm like, bitch, I've been around you for, for all year and you're either recruiting or you're selling and your preseason is four months and your regular season is five months that's nine months. Then your recruiting season is two months. You got one month. Yeah. <laughs> like, and, and, and it's, it's, they, they, they actually believe when they say that, Oh, I only work because their definition of work is like, they're doing the 80 hours a week thing for five months of the year, yeah. but they're still working 60 plus hours a week in the regular season. And, and, and I'm, and I'm like, there's gotta be something more to life than just grinding and grinding and grinding. Like, we have resources. We have, when you're young, when you're in your twenties, the only resource you really have is your time because we haven't earned money yet. Um, and if you're not responsible with your second resource, which is money, then the only resource that you'll have is time to trade for money. Right. Um, so there's nothing wrong with grinding in your twenties, but it's still important to save up money so that you're not doing that into your thirties and you can have your resources at work for you. Um, Let me ask you this to kind of, um, kind of stay in the same ballpark, but pivot at least a little bit. Um, Cause I, I, I love how we have high level intellectual philosophical conversations, Braxton. Um, it's what you tend to be posting about on your social media all the time. It's just like concepts, concepts of why, why society is kind of broken and not taking care of itself. Um, I, I'm kind of curious if you were to be living a life, Braxton, that was, you know, making money kind of on autopilot 
and your desire right to then with your freedom is to just go see what's out there what if everybody did that what would that do with the real problems perceivable pro like you could call them problems right i mean it's all about language and i know that you could say a, a few things about problems of the world like um, health and wellness issues in impoverished nations and even in our own cities in America and how there's entire you know communities that are just underserved and they're they're weak from you know food deserts they don't have food that they can go nourish their bodies with so they're physically weak um, and even mentally weak as a result um, there's communities that are like just really needing some sort of a a, a leadership that gives them hope doesn't give them resources but teaches them resourcefulness right what are yeah, your I, thoughts I, on those kinds of calls when you have your needs taken care of as opposed to just self-indulgence yep so i i reached out to a good friend yesterday um a girl that i met when i was in columbia yeah. and i texted her and i said hey i'm worried about you how are you doing and she's like really not good yeah, Columbus um, is in quite the unrestful state right now. Yeah, their their government is trying to pass some tax plan that's basically, and they're they're literally murdering people on the street for protesting. Yeah, and and I was like, how can I help? And she's like, well, bring this up, talk to people about this. Yeah. You know, this is something that people need to be aware of because, honestly, truth be told, um, the government's like this isn't really a widely covered story. Right. Um, and, and it's because um, there are elite class people that don't want us to collectively know the severity of this. And if we actually visit those places ourselves and we can see with our own eyes, because our, our journalists and our media is so corrupt. They're only, mm -hmm. I have a series of questions that I ask myself when I see something on TV. Yeah. Um, I say, why are they showing me this story over the millions of stories yeah. that, that came across their desk today? Why is this the one they're showing us? What narrative and what agenda is this story supporting? And if this agenda is escalated and, um, and uh, martial law is enacted, what rights will the governing body be taking away from us? So number four is what do I need to do today to ensure that my rights remain? So there's all these stories that come across the desk and they're like, ooh, this supports, our, this supports our agenda, this supports our agenda. But there's a lot more stories that are so much more important that really need to be told that are not being told because it doesn't support the agenda of the elite class that control the media. Um, so when I travel and I see things from my own eyes and I talk to people in their, you know, in their own environments and I'm actually learning what's really important to other cultures, I actually know the stories um, firsthand and I don't need to rely on a media source and I can therefore, you know, spread firsthand knowledge of what's really happening. And I, I just, I really think that if more people, I mean, in our world, lands that have never left the farmlands that are making them about illegal immigration, having never met an, you know, a, you know, an undocumented citizen. Conversely, we have people from the inner city who have never left their city block in their entire life yeah. that are telling people in the countryside how to live their life. If we would take time and live other people's lives and we would go see different communities, experience other cultures, we would not have this massive division that we have. I just watched um, I just watched the movie A Bug's Life yesterday. No way. Classic. Huge Throwback. Pixar fan. I've seen every Pixar movie. Um, okay. I can name every Pixar movie. Um, <laughs> I need to catch up on the recent stuff since Selling Bugs from 2013. So They're all, they're all good. Um, but I just watched A Bug's Life the other day, and um, Hopper's talking about how one ant stood up to him. And he's like, it's just one ant. And, and he's like, it's just one ant. It's just one ant. He's like, they outnumber us a thousand to one. If they figure out what, what they can do when they galvanize together, we are going to be, you know, taken down. We cannot let an ant stand up to us because then they'll all stand up to us. And, and really like yeah. metaphorically speaking, what would happen? We have all these stories and all these things that are out there dividing us. 
whether it's, you know, Republicans and Democrats or this or that, like we are divided by every story. And if you understand that Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, they're all in it together and they put out different storylines with different opinions that keep us separated and fighting over the meaning of the events that keep us apart and divide us. Like we're at like the largest division in history right now, yep. uh, of, you know, since the Civil War. Yeah. Um, well, if we understand, we are not fighting each other. We, we're, we are friends. Like we might see things differently, but we are not fighting each other. If we galvanize together against the elite, the, the elites and the people that are like really trying to control our lives, we can actually create freedom for humanity. But until, until we actually come together and until we decide to stop and, and stop fighting over pettiness, that will never happen. Yeah. So you're, you're speaking some truth, man. And I, I you know, I, I love hearing this kind of stuff because it's what I've kind of arrived at myself is the, it's, it's hard to trust people that are, you know, in these verticals of, you know, making news very sensationalized, like it's a business now, like you can't come across a news article, it's just got a vanilla title, because it's not going to get the clicks, right? It's not going to mm -hmm. drive the traffic to, to then move profit through that engine. Personally, I think you get rid of the profit motive in many things that serve the public, and you totally get rid of so many problems of private interests, getting in there and moving people around in the elite class, you know, pulling up, you know, massive wealth on top of that. But uh, I'll, I'll spare the economics discussion. Um, I, the, the thing after. is, like, the, the thing is with all of this is all the people that have the power to make that change mm -hmm. won't make the change because they're the ones benefiting from the current system. Yeah, exactly. Which is the current system is capitalism, Braxton. It's capitalism. And it's neo-capitalism or late stage capitalism rather that, uh, you know, I'm showing some true political colors here when like this is stuff that Karl Marx wrote about a long time ago in Germany. He was just like, well, I mean, if we don't change away from this profit motive that is clearly at the base of now our current world economic system, then it's just going to eat itself alive and create this like hollow gap of quality and like we, we wind up chasing the dollar sign instead of actually caring for one another, right? And yeah, this like, is where like, my trust goes from away from, you know, the upper news sources and into the mentors in my life that I know, I see their lifestyle, I see their families, I help them take care of their kids, right? That's why I'm working with Mike Yandre here in Tempe, Arizona with this company, right? Is because I know Mike, I can trust Mike. I don't have to be like, is he, is he, you know, a good person, you know, like, no, I've spent time with him. He's helped me through things. And those are the people that I trust in my life is the, the yeah. people who are in my life, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's, it, and, it, and it's like, the, like the question is like, and, and this is like even farther down the rabbit hole is like, um, why have we not heard anything about Jeffrey Epstein or Ghislaine Maxwell? Because the people, because the people that have the ability to report the story are the ones that are in trouble when, you know, when people start unweaving the story. So, yeah. okay. Oh, Jeffrey Epstein killed himself. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's the end of think, that. Chapter. I don't think any single person on earth believes that line anymore. The, the thing is, is we might not believe it, but if they don't cover the story and they, and, and there's no one that's actually <laughs> digging for the evidence, um, then it doesn't really matter. Right. So the second someone starts to dig is the second they get killed, they get suicided. And, and, and that's like the unfortunate truth of the world that we're in right now. And it's not just the, it's not just the Jeffrey Epstein thing. It's like any attack on, on the Uber wealthy can be squashed, can be squashed like a bug. And, and yeah. again, going back to the, the a bug's life thing, all we have to do is like we outnumber them a million to one and all we have to do is collectively put our differences aside and understand we all genuinely want the same thing right we all want the same thing we want a thriving healthy uh, and happy community 
what we get caught up on is how we go about doing that. Some people think it's this way. Some people think it's that way. And we fight each other on the ideas that we have and not understanding that we actually have the same vision. Yeah. It's just different paths to get to that same vision. Right. Yeah. And this is, this is why I'm like so hyper-focused on like community efforts um, in terms of like how I want to run my business, for example, um, we, we do a lot of online la- ads that just kind of like, so I'm living in Tempe, right? I'm in North Tempe. Um, ASU is right over there. I think can't, it's dark. I can't see outside, but, um, it's, it's a beautiful college town, right? So the North part of Tempe is like nothing but renters. We can't really sell them solar, right? And all these ads are all across like Scottsdale, Glendale, um, Levine, Phoenix. And it's, it's a pretty big metro. So you got to drive 45 minutes to an hour away just to get all these online leads. And I, I, since day one, I was like, let's stop this. Let's just go knock on the neighborhoods that are literally a four minute drive from our homes and just knock and introduce ourselves hey we're gonna be here for a while i'm nick this is mike and you know we're, we're even sending mailers with our faces on it and like actually doing it you know bit by bit and you know actually growing a community based conversation and the goal you know i have and will always have on my heart is to reinvest my earnings into you know different nonprofits that you know are church-based or non-church-based, more, more like education to help empower kids to, to care about the world's problems when it comes to especially resource use. Um, you know, I, I want to go back home to my own home of Omaha, right, where I, where I grew up and learned these lessons and kind of share that same stuff as well. Like, I never want to forget where I came from. I also don't want to like spread too far and too fast and just get spread too thin as a result. And that's easier said than done. Um, obviously, as you know, I've, I've kind of bounced around quite a bit in my lifetime. Um, I know you can relate to that a little bit, Braxton, but, you know, community, community efforts, that's, that's what, like, when I sold books door to door with Southwestern Man and getting to know the teachers' names, getting to know, like, here is, like, the entire town's drama, right? All the, all the families on my names list know each other, and they're just, like, this is, I mean, it's just, clear to me how communities get woven together mm. over time through families and those the way the way that those branch out and you know the like townies right you were talking about how people never leave their town and you know just kind of hate on other people like that's that's so interesting because that's just like the world as we know it wouldn't exist without people like that right yeah it's kind of held back because of people like that but like there's daily work that they do within their careers where, where it's either car repair or um, plumbing or, mm. you know, gardening and, um, you know, all these, all these things that are crucial to the, the other members of their community, right? Like, yeah, I mean, I, I actually think about that. Like I have, yeah. I have a Airbnbs. Like if I had a cleaner that was traveling worldwide, <laughs> I'd be, you know, like my cleaner, my business relies on my cleaner being in town. So right. It's, it's interesting, man. Like this, this is the, the, the bubble that kind of is emerging in every industry that tries to grow too fast. Um, and, you know, growth for the sake of growth is the ideology of a cancer cell. And mm. growth should happen, right? But within reasonable measure, you know, like if you try to grow too fast, too quick, and we've all experienced it where we try to think I'm at a high enough level to perform at a certain level. So I'm going to, you know, in the, the form of books, I'm going to set a 10,000 unit goal, even though I've never sold more than 2,300 units. You know, it's like you see people do that every single year in that business. You see it happen in every other sales job. You see it in just all these different ways where people try to like overestimate their ability because of their, their conceivability, right? They can conceive it. And they can believe it and they say, I can achieve it, but they fall short because they didn't conceive enough of what it takes to do that. They, they didn't grow enough in all the other areas of their life that it took to arrive at this goal that they can at least think of. I don't know. Um, 
we're all kids, right? We don't know. <laughs> we all learn by failing. And then we look back and, okay, I could have done this different. I could have learned this other lesson to, to grow my life and my capacities and, you know, actually deliver on these goals that I'm setting for myself and you know, whatever. But uh, yeah, I mean, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. I mean, personally, you, you spoke earlier about how life is huge on your relationship with yourself. Um, personally, I've been finding that it's, you know, my relationship with my God, um, you know, over the, over the last year in particular. And, you know, what that means to me is, is irreplaceable, you know, because I, I realize that I am able to grow um, when I put my the effort and the struggle and the pain onto that higher power. Right. So I don't know. I just had my, my soapbox. Thanks for sitting there and listening. No, I, I like, I, I, something I took away from that is like, you said, forgive them father for they know, not, know not what they do. Like everybody is the hero of their own story. Yeah. Like everybody. So everybody believes that they're doing the most good. Like I have a friend and he really believes that he is the, he, be, he truly believes that he is the greatest example of love that we have in our society today. Like he believes that okay. truly, Okay. but most of our friends believe that he is a controlling manipulative douche. Yeah. Um, but like deep down, I'm like, like, like people ask me about him all the time. I'm like, no, he actually believes that about himself. Yeah. He just, his, his definition of love has so much self-interest attached to it that it's, that it comes across as controlling manipulative, even though he thinks his behavior is for the betterment of the people around him. Um, it, it's not perceived that way. So he is still the hero of his own story. He believes that he's doing the most good when in reality, um, a lot of people don't interpret it that way. Right. So that's what I've learned is like, I really believe that everyone has pure hearts yeah. and their disconnection to their heart causes the, you know, causes the uh, behaviors that are not perceived as loving. Yeah, man. That's actually the whole thesis of this book. Let mm. me set you free. I, uh, you know, I was telling you this on the phone earlier, man, I'm going through some lady problems, whatever, like, thought this girl liked me she didn't actually or like she's just got a lot going on in her life she probably did yeah yeah probably did right keyword did but uh it doesn't matter i i'm learning so many lessons through the the, the strife that i'm going through with just that one thing um but this book talks about like um why is forgiveness important theories of forgiveness and then um right here everyone is doing the best they can yeah like that's, that's, so that's true. just like such a powerful paradigm to always hold on to when you realize that even though i mean this is in the four agreements which i know you've read right mm -hmm. um you know it's just like you can't take things personally even though it's so easy for me to do that sometimes um because I mean, everybody's just going through their own bullshit, their own stories, their own illusion, and they hurt you unintentionally. If they intended to hurt you, it's because their hurt was passed on and they, they're they exactly. blind to how that's not even helping them out. And so that's not even truly what they want, you know, and forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. It's just all you. You will like this, Nick, about forgiveness. I reached out to a girl who um, I allowed because someone only hurts me because I allow them to hurt me. Right. Mm -hmm. So I reached out to this girl who I allowed to hurt me many years ago. And, um, I called her recently and I said, I want to, I just want to tell you that I forgive you. And before you say anything, I want you to know that there is nothing for you to be sorry for. And you did nothing wrong. I have just decided to let go of the resentment that I've had from an incident involving you where I became a victim to a story and I, and I let go of that vic victim story and I've chosen to forgive. So like, just because I forgive you, Nick, does not mean that you even did anything wrong. Yeah. Right? <laughs> like you yeah. did nothing like, like this, this person did absolutely nothing wrong. You know, she did nothing wrong and there's nothing for her to be sorry about, yeah. but I have held, I have held on to something. And I said, I forgive you. And a lot of times, um, like, 
uh, before I used to say like, I forgive something that means that they should be sorry. And like, that's like the transaction where it's like, right. Nick, I'm, I'm going to, I, 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 I'm saying I forgive you, Nick. Now I expect a fucking apology. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, but I learned that I'm like, wow, I, I was like, I, I, and, and, and then, and then having the courage to say it. Right. And in like, that's like vulnerability in itself where it's like, you know, I acknowledge that I was hurt, which means I have feelings, which, you know, I am what they call a ballerina, which some of you don't know what that means. But, um, you know, it's like acknowledging that I have feelings is something that I don't like to do on a regular basis. <laughs> um, but but it's like, you know, I've really learned that like that's actually a power. It is a power, man. And this is this is another thing, you know, power, right? A power, a superpower, a skill set, a muscle, right? A discipline. I'm just starting to realize how many things are practicable skills that you can get good at and heal, you know, certain broken things within yourself. Like, um, you know, I was talking with Danny Johnston last night, um, my roommate. I know you know Danny. Uh, Love Danny. He's so awesome. And he's just, he's a total brain, right? Um, he, he's a thinker and that's, that's kind of his default mode. He doesn't see himself as an empath, even a little bit, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so I was just like, that's okay. It's just a discipline. He was like, oh, I didn't think about it like that. I was like, well, dude, I mean, this is what you're doing every single day is you're listening to freshmen, sophomores, seniors, juniors in, in college about what they want to do with their life right? You're extending empathy by just listening and then relating what their goals are for their life to how this thing that you're offering in the form of a summer internship can help them with that. Like that's a huge practice. Like you're, you're doing reps on empathy right there. And that's what I'm so thankful for full-timing with Southwestern is it helped me understand just how much I talk over people and I could do better at listening. I'm still working through that, you know, to seek first to understand, then to be understood. Um, and that's kind of the big paradigm on my own frustrations in my life right now is I just, I'm, I'm expectant of too many people to understand me versus like actually inquiring of them, you know, and it's, it's when you do that anyway, that they, they turn it in turn, show interest in you, you know, it's, it's interesting and it's all it's all skill sets it's all reps to put in to get better at those those skills book story just came up oh please <laughs> oh no. my god let, let me ask you this braxton because i forgot to ask you what your timeline is here are you able to keep going or do you want this to be like a, a final the pony let, story or something let, let's let's wrap in a few minutes yeah. um it's it's getting late so Agreed. um <laughs> oh my god I learned, so this isn't actually a book story. It is a door-to-door -door story. This is what I did, you know, selling Vivint. Um, same thing, still going door-to-door. -door. So I learned, like, I learned to actual, actually start answering the literal words of what people were saying. So I would knock on the door, knock, 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 you know, take a couple of steps back, turn to the side. And what I started saying is when people open the door and they'd say, I'm not interested. And I'd say, I started saying, what's that like? And they're like, what? What do you mean? I'm like, what is it like to not be interested? Wow. <laughs> I'm interested in everything. I'm actually interested in your lack of interest right now. So I want to know. I don't That's relate with that. What it, dude, it was the funniest fucking shit. Yeah. So I had this, I knocked on this door this one time and this angry, angry um, African-American man um it came black. out okay it's not <laughs> angry angry black man came out <laughs> and uh he's like what do you want and i took two steps back and i smiled and i said i just want people to be kind to each other thank oh. you for asking yeah. what is it that you want and he goes from like this like and he like <laughs> this puppy dog thing he goes honestly man the same thing and i'm like then why are you being so fucking mean <laughs> <laughs> And I started, I learned there's so much power in, in answering the literal questions that people are asking. What do you want? What do you want? I just want people to be kind to each other. That's what I want. Yeah. Right. And, and so like I started answering the literal questions and it, it fucked with people's minds. Like they're just like, they would snap out of it. 
and and, and like like a, another example like i was at an airport i was pick, picking up do you know matt armstrong of course okay i was picking him up at the airport the other day and i was at st petersburg airport just this tiny little airport i love st petersburg and, man Ooh. and um i'm in my little convertible my car is like a tiny little like the smallest little thing you've ever seen if whatever whatever size of a car you're thinking of right now just cut it in half that's my car yes. um this is tiny little thing and i'm sitting there and matt comes out and he puts his stuff in my car and he's like oh shit i forgot my ipad i need to go back and get it real quick um he's like i'll be back in like five minutes and i'm like okay so i'm sitting there in the car a couple minutes later this guy comes over and he's like you need to move your car and i said or what and he's like or i'll call the tow truck i'm like all right, I'll take that one. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and he's like, <laughs> he's like, no, he's like, you need to move your car. I'm like, no, you said, or you'll call the tow truck. And I'm choosing the tow, the tow truck. Nice. And, um, and he's like, well, we're, we're going back and forth. And I'm like, no, I'm holding you to your word. Call the tow truck. I'm not moving my car. <laughs> and um, he gets on the phone with the tow truck. Matt comes out. I'm like, all right, let's go. And I just drive away. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> i've just learned to ask the literal answer the literal questions being asked just, and just it is the it, funniest take it thing down the rabbit hole yeah hey bro, like like uh, it's just like the number one role of improv is yes and right yes, yeah. and uh, i'm gonna shamelessly plug my book if anyone decides to watch this entire show i don't know if you'll even get to this point or not um <laughs> i have no clue <laughs> maybe they will um but if I if you're if you're good. hang on hang on if you're watching this still can you please like leave a comment in the comment section i just want to know um i'm going to shamelessly plug my book the name of my book is called let's start a cult um, and I got this because I was going through MITT and my friends kept saying, it sounds like you joined a cult. And at first I was in cult denial. I was like, oh, it's, it's not a cult. It's like a, it's like a leadership thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's like a seminar. Right? Um, I was like in cult denial. And, I, and like, I learned the number one role of improv is yes. And hey, Braxton, you joined a cult. Yeah, of course I did. I joined a culture of people that are, you know, working towards a purpose um, that are, you know, tapping into their passion and making the world a better place would you like to join the cult event um right. or they'd say stuff like hey braxton you're brainwashed of course i'm brainwashed i've been washing my clothes and my face for 30 years <laughs> i just started washing my brain recently and i've never been thinking so clearly before in my entire life That's would awesome. you like to wash your brain too so I i've learned like no matter what you throw at me i'm just gonna own it it's kind of like jack sparrow there's a there's a part from this is, I love this part. I'm going to end with this we Jack do, Sparrow part. Have, real quick, we do have one listener, Kyle Scheel. This is his first time listening to the podcast. And nice. I love like, Kyle Scheel. Um, yeah. Hi, Kyle. I'm so glad you made it to the end of the journey. Right. Ah. Um, <laughs> no, so uh, the Jack Sparrow thing where he's, he's, he's going onto that ship and the two guards are guarding the ship and he goes on the ship and he's like, hey, you don't have permission to be aboard there. He's like, what's your purpose here in Fort Royal? He's like, I confess, it is my intention to commandeer one of these, one of these ships, take it to Tortuga, and raid and plunge the center of the seven seas. So and much. they're like, I said no lies. He's like, I think he's telling the truth. He's like, if he was telling the truth, he wouldn't have told us. And he's like, unless of course he knew that you wouldn't believe the truth, even if he told it to you. Mm. So that was that's what I've learned is like if if i'm slow if my mind is slow enough where i'm hearing the actual question that's being asked because like i did this when i was book buying when a secretary says can i help you and i say no i'm good and i just keep walking what they're actually saying is what the hell are you doing here but you asked can you help me and you actually cannot help me so <laughs> uh, <I don't> <laughs> um, so that's that's what I've learned is like slow my mind down and I actually hear the words that are being spoken and I can interrupt the pattern with a response they've never heard before. Yeah. That's fun. That's uh that's a real good like skill set and lesson that uh is great for all these these <laughs> these listeners. I mean, we got Kyle, we've got anyone else who's on audio and youtube and whatever other uploads further down the road this is just wait we're, an episode, man. we're gonna have like three thousand people listening to the end of the podcast we're yeah. gonna have like three thousand comments they're gonna be like dude i listened <laughs> yeah right 
dude it's been it's been a great pleasure to catch up braxton um you know i'm i'm sad we didn't get to celebrate your 30th birthday in what country was that supposed to be in africa yeah no what country though oh nigeria nigeria right that's because africa is a continent <laughs> but we all know that so um if if you're still gonna celebrate something in a cool place invite your boy right i will hit you up for sure Dude, small thing. I'm thinking about with Andres throwing like an adult sizzler for all the Ponytails podcast guests. I'm in. Cool. Well, you're invited. So, all right, Brian Tallaby's house. Tallaby. Yeah. Tallaby. Brian Tallaby's house. Even though he's my arch nemesis, um, <laughs> we will we will go there, and I will arch nemesis him in person. <laughs> we'll figure it out. It'll be a good time. This is this has been great, man. So, um, yeah. We'll, uh, we'll definitely, you know, promote this episode after it's uploaded to Spotify, Apple, all those audio versions. You can share that with your friends, man. Um, and then YouTube will have it uploaded there. And I'll make sure I get that done here tonight. Nah, maybe, maybe tomorrow. I don't know. Timing's a bit weird and I, my car broke down, so I need to, like, get out of here. Um, I'll, I'll keep you posted. However, um, I did want to start plugging upcoming episodes real quick. Um, for the ninth, we actually have Eric Woodward, um, who is an ASU alum. He's living here in Tempe. I haven't really talked with him since we set his episode a few weeks ago. I'm going to try and meet this guy in person and do an in-person episode. That'll be fun. Um, next Thursday is um, going to be Andres with his co-workers at, uh, from self-publishing school where he, he used to work with them for a little bit, um, still does. And um, yeah, I don't know who's involved in that. He hasn't put that on the calendar, so I can't read it off. Um, after that, on Sunday the 16th, we've got Maddie Greger, um, old Florida book check. Um, on the 23rd, we've got, um, I think that's uh, Dylan Buck. Yep. And then we've got Tessa LaPlante on the 30th. Our upcoming Thursday spots are kind of open. I don't know. Braxton, as a partial audience member, would you prefer two episodes a week or just one every Sunday? Two. All right, cool. That's good affirmation. So we'll keep filling in these, these Thursday episodes. If you want to recommend anybody, um, throw them into a group, tax, a group text with me, yourself, them, and uh, tell them you need to do this. But, you know, no pressure. So thanks for tuning in. Thanks for joining me, Braxton. Any other final words? I'm all set. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thanks, bro. All right. This has been Ponytails Podcast. I'm your co-host, Nick Taverdi with Braxton Amundsen here today, and we are signing out. Have a good one. <laughs> <laughs>